Let's talk a little bit about Jesus as the Son of Man. We, we saw that in Daniel. Remember the Son of Man? Three times is identified as the saints. And, and now, now we see in the Gospels that Jesus, his most popular designation of himself is as the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man, he forgives sins. You know that passage very well. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. His, but when you read Daniel, the Son of Man, what does he do? Receives the kingdom. So th th that, that fits with forgiving sins. That for, fits with him being the Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus says some things about the Son of Man that are surprising. He, he, his authority is veiled and concealed as well. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This, and, and most profoundly, and I have all the text there for you, the Son of Man is going to suffer and die. That category, that category is not apparent in the Old Testament, right? At least in the Son of Man passages. It's not clear that the Son of Man is going to suffer and die. So we're not surprised that when Jesus talks about himself as the Son of Man, the people are confused, right? What's he saying about himself? We also have many passages that speak of the future coming of the Son of Man to establish his kingdom. Now, those passages fit very well with Daniel 7. The Son of Man is coming to establish his kingdom his kingdom. Um, here's just one example, right? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. That is great. That's wonderful. So that, that is clearly a passage about the glorious Son of Man, isn't it? There's no doubt, no doubt about that one. Now we 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 could talk about the Son of Man for a long time. There's a lot of critical issues there, but I'm skipping those given our survey. What about the language of Son of God? I've really already said this. Son of God means Jesus is the true Israel, the true king. And, I didn't emphasize this last one, and the unique Son of God. We have all, the, all of those themes. That he, that, so the Son of God theme is a, works at, an, at a number of levels. Let's, let's just think about one psalm. Uh, and really here, I'm not restricting myself to Matthew. Okay? just because our time is passing. I just want to think of the psalm and how it's appropriated. Why do the nations rage? Very famous psalm, right? When the people's plot in vain, the kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. That's quoted in Acts 4 about the death of the Messiah. Although... There's a twist in Acts, right? You remember what the twist is? He adds the Jews in. <laughs> he adds the Jews into the psalm. Not, not just the pagan nations, the Jewish people themselves have participated. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. In the historical context of the psalm, who is that? David right? David has been installed as king in Jerusalem on Zion on the mountain of the Lord. And, the, and Yahweh is saying to the nations, 
Yahweh is saying to the nations, David's the king. David is, David is the one I've installed as king. Why, why are you raging against David? Why, why are you plotting against him? But in the New Testament, in the final fulfillment of the psalm, it's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is installed where? In the heavenly Zion, at, at God's right hand as king. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son, today I've become your father. You are my son, today I've begotten you. In systematic theology, this verse is sometimes appropriated as referring to the eternal begetting of the son, which theologically I agree with, okay? The son is eternal. He's the eternal son of the father. However, I don't think that's what this verse is about. In the historical context of the psalm, it is referring to the, to the king, the king being installed by God. God is saying to David, you're my son. I've become your father. How have I become your father? I've installed you as my king. You see? That fits, that's what I said, I'm going outside of, of I'm going outside of, Matthew, because I just want to show you how the New Testament does this. Look at where the New Testament appropriates this. Acts 13, so we're talking Luke-Acts. Paul is preaching at Pisidian Antioch, and he says, God has fulfilled for us the promises by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the, son of, in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. How does the New Testament appropriate that promise it relates to the resurrection of Jesus, right? Clearly. When... No, I need to go back to Psalm 2. Today I've become your father at, your, at the resurrection. Now, that's not saying he wasn't the father before. But if we look at Acts 13, we see, and we relate that to... Um, Psalm 2, Jesus is installed as the messianic king he, at, at the resurrection, where he's reigning at the right hand. So you see how the New Testament author appropriates the psalm. And Hebrews does the same thing, right? Same verse. Go, looking at these messianic promises, Jesus is greater than the angels because he's installed on high and it's the reigning king. He wasn't greater than them on earth, but now that he's been raised from the dead, he is. Right? On earth, he was humbled. Made a little lower than the angels, right? Chapter 2. Now he's installed as the messianic king. Well, my, you know, I went outside of Matthew, but I'm just I'm making the theological point there. Jesus, as the Son of God, now reigns at God's right hand. That's something that's found throughout the New Testament. He's the authoritative Son of God. We're not surprised, are we? Okay, there's a question. I'll take it. I'll take it. A couple of questions. Yeah. So when you look at Acts 13, 33, you would interpret the reference to the resurrection as implying his exaltation and enthronement? Yeah, I think, I think for Acts 13, those are, those are together. As the, as the risen one, he's the reigning one. His resurrection means he reigns. Yeah. You didn't have a question. Okay. We're not surprised. So, so what are we told, right? How, how's the fulfillment working in the story of the kingdom? We're going to talk about the kingdom in a moment. The kingdom has come, but what's the focus in the Gospels? Of course, the whole New Testament. But if we're thinking of the story, the focus is on what? The king. Well, not surprisingly. The, the kingdom comes with the king. So there's, who is the king? He's the son of man. He's the son of God. He's the servant of the Lord. He's the, he's the true Israel. He's the true son of Abraham. All the promises are fulfilled in him, aren't they? Everything, he's, he's the last Adam. I mean, I'm coming, going out of the gospels now. 
But it, you, you could probably connect that to the Son of Man, even, that he's the last Adam. So, you know, in one way, the old Sunday school answer is right. What's the answer? Jesus. <laughs> right? You can't go far wrong. Everything, everything finally points to, in a more profound way than a Sunday school answer, right? But everything finally points to Jesus. Everything, everything uh, finds its climax in him. Just, just to show you, again, we're spending a little more time on Matthew than we will on Mark and Luke. But notice Jesus' authority in the following ways. His authority is king. He calls his disciples. In Judaism, you would put yourself as a disciple under a rabbi, but your uh, tutelage, just like in this class, right? Your tutelage is a disciple when? I teach, I teach, you know, I'm a supervisor for doctoral students, but some of my doctoral students are smarter than I am. <laughs> and then they become colleagues. And then they may tell me where I'm wrong, right? That happens. That didn't happen with Jesus. <laughs> the, 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 discipleship, the discipleship is an internal discipleship, isn't it? They're, they're disciples forever. Jesus says, uh, if your family is more important than I am, you're not worthy of me. I mean, right? Would you say that to anybody? <laughs> no. But the authority of Jesus, take up your cross and die for my sake. You find your life or you lose it for Jesus' sake. You get eternal. You know, the, the, the passage about the rich ruler, isn't that a fantastic and interesting passage? Because he wants to know how to get eternal life, and Jesus says, keep the commandments. Well, I've done it. Check. How can I enter the kingdom? How can I have eternal life? I kept the commandments. Jesus says, no, you have to sell everything. He doesn't say that to everyone, does he? But he says it to him. What's his Lord? What's his, what's his false God? It's his riches, right? So he says, you, you sell everything and follow me. I'll know you really belong to God if you're my disciple. If you, if you sell everything and follow me. And of course, he's not, he's not willing to do it, showing that he's not a believer. Jesus is the bridegroom with the new wine. Talked about in Joel and Amos, right? How's the wine going to drip off those mountains? It's going to happen through Jesus. And, and actually, we think of John 2, right? The, 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 the wine at the banquet. I think part of that is saying, hey, the kingdom's here. You know Amos 9? You know Joel 3? The story is telling you something about the fulfillment of the promises. And then, and then two very fascinating passages where Jesus stills the storm. And um, by, the, by the way, there's a book out by, um, well, we read it in colloquium last semester, by Daniel Kirk, on uh, something like Jesus attested by God. And Daniel argues that all these passages about Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels only prove that he's a man and not God. And uh, he rightly shows that Jesus' humanity is emphasized, but it's it's a clear case of reductionism. <laughs> and <clears throat> two of the places I was really unhappy with what he did was right here. The stilling of the storm passage. <clears throat> because, you know, remember this passage in Psalm 107. These great deliverances in Yahweh's, and we have the deliverance of the sailors. Remember that? And it says... <clears throat> And Yahweh delivers sailors. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. That's what Jesus does, right? There's an echo there in that passage. Does he quote the passage? He doesn't, but he echoes it big time. Jesus is divine. Who can still the, a storm? That's not something human beings do. See, you know, I, I've even met some conservatives say that's what human beings can do. But that's not the illusion we find to Scripture. That's not the scriptural allusion and echo. We want, to, we want to anchor our theology in a scriptural text. And there it is, so fascinating. And the other one is he walked on the water. He walks on the water. And then, wait, I forgot the reference. Oh, Job 9 8. Um, <clears throat> he alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. I mean, it's talking about Yahweh. And uh, 
I just want to show you the Alex X there. I know you don't all read Greek. <clears throat> he stretches out the heaven alone, and he walks as upon the dry ground upon the sea. So it's even more emphatic in the Alex X. He walks on the water. And there's the word used for Jesus, peripatel, right? The participle here, peripaton. He walks on the water, you know? He's the, that's what God does. You know, Kirk says he invites Peter to walk on the water. <laughs> well, yeah, he does. But the point, the whole point of the story is Jesus invites him to walk on the water. And, of course, Peter sinks anyway. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's something he can do at Jesus' behest. It's so clear. Sometimes I feel like when Kirk reads the narrative, like, do you know how to read stories? I mean, it's so clear that Jesus walking on the water is a different in kind from what Peter does. How could you compare those two? I thought that was awful. So, so the authority of Jesus. Okay, anything you want to say so far about that? Let's talk about the kingdom a little bit. So, Matthew prefers the language of kingdom of heaven. The other gospels, kingdom of God, kingdom of God four times, kingdom of heaven 32 times. The typical scholarly view out there is that Matthew, Matthew uses kingdom of heaven following a Jewish tradition of not wanting to mention the name of God. Right? So you say heaven instead of God. That's the typical scholarly view. But my colleague, Jonathan Pennington, wrote his dissertation on this under Richard Bauckham at St. Andrews. And I think Jonathan has rightly shown that that older scholarly view isn't persuasive. Um, for one thing, as he points out, Matthew does say kingdom of God. If you want to avoid it, and, and, and furthermore, he uses the name of God, I mean the, 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 the word God, many times in the gospel. So I think Pennington is right, is that you see a particular authorial purpose. Here's biblical theology, right? You, you discern a particular purpose in using heaven, and it's what heaven, heaven and earth language, God's transcendent. He's above us, right? We're on earth, he's in heaven. So the, the, the distance, if, if, you, if you speak of heaven and earth, it connotes the distance between God and us. It doesn't only connote distance, but also given the biblical storyline, it it connotes righteousness and wickedness. God's in heaven and we're on earth. And, and, and Jonathan points out, Daniel is often appropriated by Matthew. So what you see, what you see in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew is a recognition that the kingdoms of this world are evil. But God's kingdom is a good kingdom. Or another way, you know, you have the transcendent, the kingdom is, is transcendent, the coming of the kingdom, it comes from heaven. It's supernatural, isn't it? It's, it's a supernatural gift given to us from, from God himself. So how, how, how after 2,000 years of promises, how is the kingdom going to come? It's going to be a miracle. Of course, we've been prepared for that in the Old Testament, haven't we? But it's going to come from a king, Right? And, and it, it's, a, it's a kingdom that will come by God's grace and God's, God's power. Just a little bit on who's the kingdom for. It's for the poor in spirit. Isn't that fascinating? That's how he begins the Beatitudes. It's for those who are spiritually impoverished. It's for those who know they're, they're weak. I mean, do I have it here? Matthew, Matthew 18, maybe I have this later. It's for those who know their children. So what great news, you know, what great news we have to preach. We don't, we don't go out and preach to people. The kingdom's for the strong. The kingdom's for the mighty. The kingdom's for the noble. The kingdom's for the good. Now, Jesus says again and again, the kingdom is for those who admit that they need. They need God. They need help. They need forgiveness. The kingdom is for those who are humble enough to admit that they need the power of the kingdom, the power of the king. So that, the, 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 it's a, Many people have said it's an, 
an upside down kingdom, isn't it? It's not the kingdom you would expect to come. And um, how wonderful that is. What a, what a blessing that is. How, you know, when, for, at least for me, if I think, well, the kingdom's for the strong, well, I don't qualify. The kingdom's for the good, I don't qualify. But the kingdom's for the weak, I qualify. <laughs> the kingdom's for sinners, then that's for me. Then I, it's for me. Uh, I, we just have to admit it, right? I, I, need, I need him. I need him every hour, right? I'm prone to wander. I need his grace. So that's such great news about the kingdom. Um, and that, isn't that what Paul says in Romans 2? What's the problem with the Jews? They have hard hearts and they don't want to repent. I think of my own family members who aren't saved. What's their problem? They're nice people, mainly, you know, but they don't want to repent. That's the thing. I think they're fine. Yeah, everything's fine. I don't need God. The kingdom's for those who say they need God. And of course, Jesus tells us those who are religious can cloak their religion and their, they use their religion as a way of not needing God. That's the most subtle sin of all, isn't it? One of my colleagues, oh, well, he's retired now, but many of you may know him, Tom, Tom Nettles. Do you know that name? Tom taught church history for many years at Southern. He actually still teaches for us with Tom's. 67, 68, so he teaches adjunct for us. He's retired. But when Tom went to seminary, he wasn't saved. <laughs> he got saved in seminary. That doesn't happen very often, but he, but he realized in seminary, I'm not even saved. <laughs> Thank God he got saved. So, anyway, the mysteries of the kingdom. The mysteries of the kingdom. Uh, chapter 13. The secrets of the kingdom, right? The things hidden about the kingdom. What was hidden about the kingdom? Chapter 13 is a very important chapter, isn't it? So we talk about the fulfillment of the kingdom. What's, what's hidden? And I'd say, along with many, the already but not yet nature of the kingdom. That's, that's the secret. Right? The, the, the secret is, if you read those parables, the kingdom overlaps with the present evil age. The kingdom doesn't come immediately with apocalyptic power. So you, you, you can see how this would land on the Jews. Jesus says, I'm the king. The kingdom's coming. The kingdom's coming me. It's raining. They're like, huh? The world stays in the same. That's not the kingdom. <laughs> That's not the kingdom. We know, we've read Daniel. When the kingdom comes, all those other kingdoms go away. Right? And then it's like a big rock that takes over. Or the son of man receives the kingdom. It's not... The kingdom's here, and life goes on as usual. You can see why they disbelieved, right? That's not the kingdom. Give me a break. But Jesus says, no, the kingdom's as small as a mustard seed. That's what he says, doesn't he? The kingdom's hidden like leaven. It, only those who have eyes to see, see it. It will become a tree. It will spread throughout the whole dough. Big hermeneutical issue here. Post-millennialists say that it's growing all through history. It's gradually spreading through the dough all through history. So very interesting, isn't it? That's it. I, I suppose you could hold some form of that view and not be a post-millennialist too. Um, so maybe there's some truth in that, but I'm definitely not a post-millennialist. <laughs> um, I tend to think Ladd interprets this as it becomes a tree and it spreads through the dough only at the second coming. So you see a different reception of the parable. That's a hard issue hermeneutically, isn't it? <coughs> but I think there's a lot of grounds not to be a post-millennialist. By the way, can I just say to everyone, I want to be a post-millennialist. I'd love it, you know? Wouldn't that be the greatest, you know? I mean, a lot of a lot of Ameri a lot of Puritans were post-millennial. Jonathan Edwards, were, and you can read Ian Murray's book. Have you read it, The Puritan Home? I read that book, and I was so encouraged. Even though I'm not a post-millennialist, so maybe that didn't really fit. But I thought, man, wouldn't that be great? The world slowly being transformed by the gospel. But I'm not convinced. So I tend to think Glad is right. The kingdom will come. It'll spread through the dough. It'll be a tree at the second coming. I tend to think that's right, but it's hard to be sure. But even if it's spreading, even if there's a sense of it growing, 
I don't, I don't think you have to go a post-millennial route, you see. You could say it's growing, but see, I'm talking back and forth. Am I confusing you as I talk back and forth? I, I tend not to hold that view because I tend to think the kingdom is still to the world of mustard seed. When the world looks at it like, you represent the king, you guys? It's hidden from them. It's small to them. And we, and, 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 and we, we kind of sympathize with that. Yep, we're the representative of the king. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> Got to us. We're not all that you would hope we'd be, but we're the ones. So it's, the kingdom is that treasured pearl worth everything. The kingdom is given to those who repent. And I love the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Even at the 11th hour, even at the 11th hour, even at the end. You, know, you had Carl Truman with you last year. Maybe some of you were in that class. And one thing, when Carl preached, preached in chapel at Southern recently, I really liked one thing he said. It's the only thing he said that I liked. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I liked a lot of things that he said. But he said, he said uh, you know, our culture is very <laughs> resistant to the gospel today. There's, there's not that cultural resonance with our message that, you know, even when I grew up, I grew up as a Catholic, but I knew I should be giving my life to God. I didn't, but I knew that. A lot of people in our culture don't hold that anymore. They're more like, prove to me God's good. He's a, they think God's bad. So they're, but, but, but Carl said to us that people are going to die. They're going to die. And when they're dying, that's a great opportunity for witness. Because if they die slowly, they're going to think about their lives. They're going to think about their future. Not everyone, but a lot of them. And I think that's true. That's a, that's a great opportunity for the proclamation of the gospel. And Jesus says here, you can repent at the 11th hour. We don't encourage people to do that, do we? But you can. You can be let in. So, uh, lots of other things we could say about the kingdom, but, that, but the, key, the key point I'm making here is The fulfillment has come, but in a surprising, astonishing way. Not in the way we expect. 